This video will discuss some of the concepts of general relativity, a uh, more advanced theory than special relativity. Special relativity is restricted to situations where the velocity is constant. General relativity allows acceleration, allows the uh, velocity to change. So this is an important uh, subject as far as studying our universe. And, there are situations where large mass, large energy can distort space-time and uh, give us a little different unexpected view than what we uh, uh, typically have for situations where there's not a large gravity field uh, in play. This theory was more mathematically difficult and it's still mathematically difficult for, for people, but it is now mathematically understood and Einstein was able to put together some conclusions uh, so after about 10 years after special relativity, so brings us to about 1915, Einstein came up with his theory of general relativity. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, start looking at uh, what's involved here with this theory. Again, some of the slides here are from OpenStax College, uh, the uh, PowerPoints that they've made available freely to people. So the, the foundation of general relativity is the principle of equivalence. The acceleration of a reference frame and the acceleration due to gravity produce the same observational results. So we'll be able to understand some situations uh, by using this principle of equivalence if we can understand the acceleration, the effect on some observation due to acceleration of a reference frame. Then we can understand the effect of what we call gravity on that, uh, that object as well. Uh, if the two values are the same, if the acceleration is some meters per second squared and the gravitational uh, situation produces the same acceleration due to gravity of some meters per second squared, then these two uh, experiments will come out to be the same. Principle of equivalence. This is foundational to general relativity. It's a little bit of a similar role to what the postulates of special relativity uh, help us in developing uh, concepts, answers to situations. So here we have a situation of a person in an elevator and it's accelerating upward in this top frame. The bottom one, the elevator's at rest right at the earth. And let's suppose it's accelerating at 9.8 meters per second squared upward. Well, that value is chosen because that's acceleration due to gravity. So this person has a flashlight or a laser if the elevator speed was constant, then the beam would go straight across horizontally. Um, this is a, a special relativity coming into play at constant velocity. We can't do an experiment that will tell us if we're moving or not. Um, so we go straight across whether the elevator is at rest or has some motion to it. But if the elevator is accelerating, though the beam starts across, light has a finite speed. So it takes some time for it to get over to this side of the elevator. By the time it gets here, the elevator is going faster, 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 and the elevator wall gets upward faster than the beam of light. So we have a situation where we're going to see the beam appear to bend downward if the elevator is accelerating upward. So let me run through that again. If there's no motion to the elevator or moving with constant speed, the beam of light will go straight across. We're in deep space away from any gravity. So whether we're, speed is zero for the elevator or we're moving at some constant speed, uh, principle of relativity, we'll get the same result. But if we let the elevator accelerate, as the beam of light comes across here, the speed of the elevator is going to change. And the floor of the elevator, the wall of the elevator is going to be moving faster and faster in this upward direction. And as the person here sees this play out, what they'll see is the beam of light hit lower. What's actually happening is the floor of the elevator and the wall is going faster upward. That brings some lower portion of the wall in line with the beam. The lower portion of the wall gets in line with the beam because the elevator is moving faster upward. So we see this bending down. So principle of equivalence. Let's take this elevator and uh, we're on the earth, resting on the earth. 
The principle of equivalence says we're going to get the same result for an experiment if our system is accelerating or we're in the presence of gravity. Our situation in the acceleration case is we saw the beam of light bend down. We will see the same thing on the Earth due to gravity. The elevator is not moving here, it's not accelerating, but gravity causes the beam of light to move down. We get the same result in a situation where there's acceleration and a situation where there's just gravity. Principle of equivalence. This told Einstein that gravity will cause a bending of the path of light. So let's talk about this space-time and this uh, the curvature of space-time is what we need to understand gravity in uh, the theory of general relativity. So the shortest path in space-time, space-time is three dimensions, x, y, and z, and the dimension of time. A geodesic is the shortest path in space-time and shortest is this combination of not only space but time. Uh, general relativity deals with changes in time as well in a different way than special relativity but there are situations where clocks will run at a different rate uh, due to the uh, ideas of general relativity. It turns out that light naturally moves on a geodesic. Light will take the shortest path in space-time from point A to point B. So on the Earth, if you're flying to Europe, you might notice that you fly over uh, the northeast part of Canada, might be able to see Greenland on your way, and eventually land over here. Why is it that the airlines would take what we see as a longer path instead of this direct route? Well, this great circle, we're being misled by this flat map. But on a sphere, it turns out that this great circle is a shorter distance than just going directly as the flat map would show. A great circle is a shorter distance. It is a geodesic on the Earth's globe. This uh, great circle route is a shorter path, and it didn't take the airlines long to figure that out. They could save money, get the airplane to Europe in a shorter amount of time if they fly on a great circle route. So the same thing happens with light. So here is a representation of curved space-time, of curved space-time. And the lines that you have here in red, these are geodesics. They're going from point A, let's say down here, to point B up here. Uh, going straight through here is not the shortest in space-time. It's following this red line is the shortest path in space-time. So again, we're getting some um, unexpected results like we had with special relativity. But in general relativity, we talk about the warping, the bending of space-time, and we see that uh, these red lines are actually the shortest. These are geodesics. They're the best path that light can take to get from point A to point B. Um, so Einstein uh, uh, applied this to the sun and seeing stars in the sky near the sun. He said that the gravity of the sun the, actually, the mass of the sun will bend space-time around the sun and cause a change in the apparent position of a star. Well, this effect uh, works best if the starlight is going very close to the sun. What's the problem with taking a photograph of the sky in the region near the sun and finding a star on that photograph? Well, the sun makes a blue sky. That blue sky is brighter than starlight. So is there a situation, is there a time when during the day, the sun above the horizon, that the sky would go black? And the answer is yes. During a solar eclipse, if the moon passes in front of the sun, we can get a situation where the sky is black. So this was done in 1919, and uh, we have a photographic record here photograph taken in 1919 during the solar eclipse. The sun has a very thin outer atmosphere called the corona that is here, but relatively near the sun you can see these hash marks. They're enclosing images of stars. So there's some stars that were measured in their position. Uh, photographs were taken six months prior to this at night when the sun was not in the sky. The positions of these stars were measured and 
They measured again at the solar eclipse, and what was found is that the stars shifted position as predicted by general relativity. There have been many, many more experiments and observations uh, done since 1919, and in all of those, general relativity is confirmed. Uh, some people prefer to see a, a negative image, that they think they can see the stars a little better than that, but uh, we have, again, the same uh, result. The stars shift position because the mass of the Sun is warping space-time. It's warping space-time. And the I'll go back uh, a little bit here. So we get this situation and so the Sun at the middle of this depression here, the Sun's mass is distorting space-time. Einstein would say we can replace gravity with the geometry of space and that the mass of the Sun warps space-time. And in this situation, we talk about the planets moving around the Sun. Newton would say there's a force of gravity between the planet and the Sun. And that's an okay kind of calculation, but Einstein uh, did one better. Einstein replaced the force of gravity with geometry, and the planets go around the Sun in their orbits, because as they move forward, they're also uh, tending to move downhill towards the sun. And their forward motion keeps them in orbit. But this is a better representation of what actually happens. The sun warps space-time. And not a, a terrific analogy, but uh, if you watch NASCAR, a car going around a corner at 200 miles an hour, the banking of the track helps the cars go around the corner. Um, so it's not quite the same, but there is sort of a banking of space-time, and the planets go around the sun because they're on this slope. They're on this slope. If I would just release a marble here with no forward motion, it's going to roll down the slope towards the sun. Okay? And we might call that gravity, as we'd observe it out here, a force of gravity. But actually, it's just the natural motion of the object going downhill in space-time. Um, there's a big observational uh, consequence as well to this, and that is that the orbit of Mercury slides around, shifts around. And sometimes Mercury is close to the Sun, and this going down this hill um, causes its orbit to shift around. This was a big mystery in the 1800s as to why Mercury's orbit shifts, but fully explained by Einstein's general theory of relativity that the Sun warps spacetime and the motion of Mercury through this uh, more curved region causes the orbit to shift around. It's not a big shift, but it's measurable and explained by general relativity. Um, so this, is, uh, this was, you know, made Einstein world famous when this uh, result came out, that um, he could explain something that uh, others could not explain, that uh, the mass distorts space-time, and we get an observable change in the path of light. Um, so let's go a little further here. On a cosmological scale, as we look deep into the universe, um, we can observe this bending of light on a grand scale. So suppose we have a very distant galaxy here, and it sends light out in all directions, but this light can be somewhat gathered by the gravity of a galaxy in between, or a whole cluster of galaxies between the Earth and this distant galaxy. This is not to scale. <laughs> The Earth is much further away in this drawing and much smaller. Um, this distant galaxy here is much further to the left, but the principle is, is correct. As the light goes past the galaxies or clusters of galaxies, it's going in this curved space-time created by the mass that's here, and that ends up changing the trajectory of the light. When it comes to Earth, we trace that back and we see an object here, and we see an object here, and we measure the spectra of these two points of light, and we find out that they are the same. We find that the spectra are the same. Um, the Doppler shift is the same, etc. And that gives us very good evidence that these objects really, the light here that we see at different places, actually came from one place. This gravitational lens has gathered the light and sent it towards the Earth. 
some uh, photographs of this, not just drawings, but these are real photographs. These are not paintings. And every place you see an arc, that is light from a distant galaxy that this cluster of galaxies, these brighter galaxies here, are close to the Earth compared to the galaxies that uh, generate the light that make these arcs. Um, so that's one. Here's another one recently uh, uh, made available on the internet in 2015. A smiley face, uh, Einstein arc. Now we have these closer galaxies to us. This light is coming from a distant galaxy and the gravitational lensing has smeared out the light so it's not just a point. Um, depends on the distribution of the mass here as to what shape we get for the, uh, for the light. Here's what's called the Einstein cross and these four outer points of light all have the same spectra. They're, this light is coming from one distant object that's more distant than the central uh, light that we see here, the object that creates a central light. But the light has been gathered and somewhat focused and we get four images of one distant object. This is actually being used by astronomers as a powerful technique to see more distant objects. This gravitational effect uh, gathers the light and makes it brighter than if we just were looking at the, uh, at the more distant object by itself. Another effect of general relativity that's uh, predicted is that if we have a very dense object here, as light goes away from it, it has a redshift. This is not the Doppler redshift, but the light is stretched out as it loses energy moving away from this high gravitational uh, uh, situation. The light loses energy and becomes redder than when it was emitted. This has been observed for very small dense stars that the uh, light is redshifted. Another effect is that when mass is in motion, the prediction is it creates gravitational waves. Well, you've seen water waves. Imagine waves of space okay, moving through our solar system, moving through our galaxy. These are predicted and there's some indirect evidence that they exist that these waves take energy away from the system where they're generated. There's evidence that that is occurring, but so far we don't have direct observation of space-time uh, shifting back and forth at the Earth. There are telescopes that are being built called gravitational wave telescopes, and uh, they've not produced any positive results yet. It's a very difficult measurement to see this uh, length change from end to end. Um, in this telescope and future results are anticipated. So there we have uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity. It's a theory that describes space-time as being curved, distorted by mass and energy. We have the Sun giving enough uh, effect to shift the position of stars in the sky uh, during a solar eclipse. It's measured when those stars uh, change their uh, their apparent position on the sky due to the gravitational effect of the Sun due to the mass of the Sun bending space-time. Um, another effect if I maybe go back here just a little bit um, another effect is that clocks run at different speeds whether the clock is near the star or far away there's a change in the rate of time and this is a uh, something that our GPS satellite system takes into account. The GPS satellites correct for special relativity effects, uh, speed, their clocks running slower, and they correct for the gravitational um, effect on, on the clocks. Uh, if these effects were not taken into account, your GPS would be off by about six miles more every day. So it is not a minor effect. Um, just the gravity of the Earth warp space-time around the Earth, and that's a, a, an effect that has to be taken into account for our GPS system. Many other tests, again, of general relativity have been done, and uh, everything is uh, in agreement with the theory of general relativity. It is an accepted theory for how the universe behaves. Mass distorts space-time, mass curves space-time, 
and creates these uh, effects of shifting the path of light, no longer moving in a straight line, but following the geodesic, following the shortest path in space-time to go from uh, one place to another. So that's where uh, I'm going to stop here, but you should keep on reading. You should write down some questions and uh, ask your instructor.